name. Amen. You may be Amen. seated. If you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and open them up to uh, Romans chapter 10. We'll be there in just a little bit. But know this, in a few weeks, April uh, 17th, we'll be celebrating Easter here in this worship center, in this church. It's the greatest, uh, most significant Christian holiday of the year. And we will be celebrating that here at 815 and 1045 on that Sunday morning. We'll have a, uh, a, um, a good Friday service on that Friday. Obviously, it'll start at 630. We'll do the Lord's Supper on that service. And here's what's going to happen. All of your friends and all of your family are going to be coming in town for that particular service. You're going to gather together. You're going to put on your nicest clothes, the, the clothes that you've just bought. They're all going to be in those pretty spring colors. They're going to look lovely. The little girls are going to be dressed up in beautiful little dresses. The young men will be dressed up all nice. We'll take pictures together. You'll come to church together. You'll worship together. You'll leave here from church. You'll go home, and you will have a lunch, uh, obviously fit for a king, including deviled eggs, which I've never quite understood on, uh, on, on Easter Sunday. But they'll be there. You'll have all the ham. You'll have everything that you ever, ever think of on, a, on an Easter Sunday. You'll take a nap. It'll be a well-deserved nap. And at the end of that nap, everybody will get up and they will go back to their homes where they came from if they traveled in town or they'll go back to whatever's normal. And here's what I know will happen. Is that on that Sunday morning, we will have a lot of people who have been walking with the Lord for a long time in their life. Whom if you ask the question, if something were to happen to you today, are you 100% sure you would go to heaven? And the answer is out of their mouth would be less than 100%. And here's, there's a lot of reasons that that could possibly happen. But here's one of the reasons that I think is the main reason that that happens, is that they don't really understand salvation to begin with. So they question their own. And here's what I mean by that. Somewhere along the way, somebody trusted in the, the phrase, well, you know, I've been a Christian my whole life. Well, no, you haven't. But they trusted in that particular sentiment. Well, I grew up Baptist, or I grew up Methodist, or I grew up Catholic, whatever. The, and I've, I've just been Methodist or Baptist. Well, that doesn't make you saved. That makes you Baptist or Methodist or Catholic. It doesn't make you anything other than that, right? It, 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 it doesn't mean that, that you prayed a prayer one time because people trust in the prayer that they prayed. Because somebody told them one time, hey, you'll just pray this prayer. And so they trust in that prayer. They, they walked an aisle one time, or they cried at youth camp. And because they did those things, they put their faith in that experience, in that moment, which it's important that we remember that. And it's important that we understand where we were and what we were doing that moment that we came into a relationship with God. But people put their trust in that as opposed to God himself. And because they don't really understand everything that God is and everything that he offers and so what happens is when the trials come, and we know just because we've lived long enough in this room that trials will come, there'll be financial hardships, we'll lose people to, to sickness or, or you know, whatever, and we will, we will go through situations in our life that are emotionally hard to go through. We'll, we'll go through things where we question uh, choices that we've made in our lives. And as a result, we'll go try to fall back on that experience to trust that God is taking care of us. If something is coming up for me, then, then am I okay? And, and there's a lot of people that question their salvation because at the end of the day, those moments fail them. And because they fail them, they question their salvation. And because they question their salvation, they're trapped. And here's why I say that they're trapped. is because someone who's been walking with the Lord for a long time that's a very difficult conversation for somebody to have with somebody else and say, hey, look, I know that I've gone to church for 20 years, 25 years. I know that I have uh, been singing the songs. I've served on, as a deacon. I've, I've served on different uh, missions and, and different things like that. But if the truth were told this morning, I'm not sure that if something were to happen to me that I would go to heaven. And so they struggle silently because... They don't want to bring up that conversation because they don't want to look like they don't have it all together. Because we always want to look like we have it all together. And so here's, here's the thing. This morning, as I'm getting ready to, to dive into this, here's what I know. Is right now, some of you are thinking, this message is not for me. It's got nothing to do with me. I'm good. I have 100% assurance of my salvation. I'm good. Then you're right. This message is not for you. 
but it's not that you can't use this message. So here's my challenge for you. So some people in here are going, JJ, just get into it because I want to go ahead and get this settled. And I know that there's some of you in here that are like that. But there's others of you. Here's, here's my challenge to you. If you're already okay with everything, you don't need the rest of this message. The rest of this message I want to challenge you with, I would love for you to share this message with your family. Don't worry about your friends and everybody, but start with your family. And if you, if you can go further, great. But start with your family and everybody that you'll be inviting to Easter, everybody that you know will be here, everybody that you know will be celebrating Easter somewhere. And say, hey, look, I want to share this message with you for the sole purpose of, I'd like for us to have this conversation. What a great opportunity for a segue for you to have a conversation about somebody's assurance of their faith then to send them a message and say, hey, my pastor told me I had to do this, so I'm sending it to you. Just you know, bear with me, right? And send it to them have, them, listen, have them listen to it, and then have the conversation. Hey, I know he said, talked about having assurance of your salvation. You and I have never had this conversation, but it would be okay if I asked you, if you're 100%, after you've listened to that message, where do you stand? Because what you're going to do by doing that is you're going to open the door to have a faith conversation with somebody that may be desperately wanting to have it. And so for you that are 100% sure this morning, that's my challenge to you. Listen to this. Start thinking about and praying about right now, who will you send this to? And so that when Easter comes around in a few weeks, that everybody can come in here and they can worship because they know they're saved and not have to worship in fear that they might not be saved. Does that make sense? And so we're going to dive into a couple of things. And so we're going to start in Romans chapter 10. That's going to be our base verse. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It's going to be our base, for, base verses this morning. And we're going to work from there. And it says this. Paul is writing to the church in Rome. And he says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So that's the starting verse. That's the one we're going to use as the basis for everything else that we're doing. What I want us to do this morning is I want us to understand salvation. I want us to understand better who God is, and I want us to understand what we can trust instead of an experience that we can trust God's word, we can trust God himself, and we can trust his promises, right? So the first thing I want you to see this morning is this. Number one, knowledge is the path to belief, right? Knowledge is the path to belief. Head knowledge is, is basically, it's functional data. We use it to process the world around us. Uh, it's used for education. It's used for teaching. It's used for being able to play notes like, like Jan is able to do, and incredibly uh, gifted in that area. It's, it's used for all kinds of making informed decisions and everything else. And knowledge is simply information. There's, there's no saving power in knowledge whatsoever. Now, the reason I know that is this. If there were saving power in knowledge and, and just the knowledge of who Jesus is, then everybody who has ever heard about Jesus would be saved. But we know that not to be true, right? Even the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 19, verse 15, is that one day the, de- the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Like, even the demons know. James chapter 2, verse 19 says, you believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. The demons believe and know that there's God. But they don't, that doesn't make a, a, a difference of salvation in their, in, in their existence. Does that make sense? There's a whole, there's a whole aspect of, of knowing, knowing about something. But if it's simply head knowledge, it makes absolutely no difference other than just for functional data. But the difference comes in this. When we move that head knowledge into a heart knowledge, then things begin to change dramatically. It's no longer just functional data. It's a passion. It's a relationship changer. It, it, it causes us to do things we might not have otherwise done. It causes us to take steps we wouldn't have otherwise taken. And it makes us go down a path that we need to go down. For instance, 
In Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Now listen, I'm going to be giving you a lot of scripture today. And so if you don't keep up with all of it, I'm going to post this online on our, our webpage. You can go back and grab all of it then, or you can look it up on YouTube and catch it, get, catch it there as well. So I'm going to go kind of fast through some of this. But in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, it says this. Is that Philip had been told to go to the chariot where the uh, Ethiopian eunuch was, and he was reading the scriptures, and he didn't understand the scriptures. And so Philip went over to him, and he took the knowledge that he had been reading and helped, helped make it a heart passion, a heart knowledge for him. And it, the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. You see in, in uh, Acts chapter 9, you see this, the, uh, the conversion story of Saul. We know that Saul knew about Jesus. We know he had a knowledge of Jesus. And the reason we know that is because he was doing everything he could to kill off Christians in any way, in any way possible. As a matter of fact, when he was on the road to Damascus, he was on his way to go collect Christians and to separate them from their families and to possibly kill them and to torture them and, and to stop all this Jesus business. And he runs into Jesus on the road to Damascus, and we know that he is, comes into a, a conversion experience where his head knowledge becomes a heart knowledge. It's different for him. In Acts chapter 16, it tells the conversion story of a lady named Lydia who was a dealer in purple cloth, and it said that the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. And as a result, not only was she saved, but her whole family was saved as well. And so it begs the question, then, what knowledge do we need to believe? What knowledge do we need to take from our head and put into our heart so that it begins to transform us and to do something with that? Well, the first thing I would say that you need to, you need to believe is this, is that we must believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. In Mark chapter 16, verse 6, when they go to the tomb and it's empty and they're looking for Jesus the person, the, the angel that is there says, he's not here. He is risen. We have lots and lots of scripture that, that uh, gives example after example of Jesus being spotted and visiting with eyewitnesses after his resurrection. You realize that we are the only faith in the world that serves a living God. We are not a faith that serves a, a, a prophet who came and wrote some books and now sits in a tomb somewhere. We serve a risen and living God. And the Bible tells us that if that's not so, then your faith is, is, is futile anyway. It doesn't make any difference. But we serve a risen God, and we must believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. Number two thing that we must know is that we must not only know about Christ, but we must know him personally. If you've ever spent time in Psalms at all, you would know that it does a great job of giving you so many different character traits of who God is. It talks about his power and his majesty and his compassion and his forgiveness. It talks about the way that he is able to, to intricately weave the world together and be able to do things that we can't even begin to. He says, it, says, it tells us in Psalms that he, he's the one that told the oceans where to stop. I mean, he, he's incredibly powerful and he's incredibly good. But a lot of times we don't spend the time in God's word to know who he is, the very character of who he is, and know what he's like. And that makes a difference. Anybody who's been married or in a relationship for more than 20 minutes knows that when you spend a lot of time with somebody, you begin to take on the characteristics of that individual. You begin to see them and know them in different ways. If you go to a restaurant with your spouse and you've been married for 25 years, chances are you can go to a particular restaurant, whatever restaurant it is, and you know what they're going to order from that restaurant. You could order for your spouse, not because you're being you know, chivalrous, but because you just have seen them order the same thing year after year after year. You get it by now, right? You want to cook this particular way. You want it with these sides. We understand. When you go to this restaurant, that's the meal you're having. We get it when we spend time with somebody. We know them. And we understand them. And it's personal. It's not just head knowledge. It affects my life. It affects the way that I, I see things, the way that I, I react to things. When I know somebody that personally, and that's the way that we should know God. It's, it's so personal that it affects our everyday life. That we, when we get into a situation, we should know how God would respond in this particular situation. We should know who he is and what he's doing. And the third thing I would say that we must believe is that we must not only know Christ the martyr, but we must know Christ the victor. In Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11, this is what Paul says about that. And he says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God 
the Father. We do not serve a dead God. We serve a God that sits at God's right hand. He's there and he is, he is the creator of all things. That's who the Bible says that he is. And we must, we must move that knowledge into a heart knowledge that causes us to do things. Because here's what happens. The more we know of ourselves in light of who Jesus is, the more we understand we need a Savior. Let me clarify. The more we know that we lack the answers to the questions that we're seeking. Right? Because we've searched in every single thing that we could possibly search for peace. We've searched in food. We've searched in drink. We have searched in relationships. We have searched in finances. We have searched in careers. We have searched in families. We have searched in all kinds of different ways. And we have never found the thing that gives us ultimate peace. It may give us peace for a while, but what we know is that ultimately there's something that comes along that fractures that peace, and we're no longer at peace in that situation anymore. And what we're constantly doing is looking for that peace. What I want us to see this morning is that when we begin to understand who we are in light of who Jesus is, there is peace that never gets fractured. And it's in him. We, we begin to see our inabilities to fix eternity. Because as much as we worry about what happens in life after death, we understand that we can't do anything about it. We want to be able to do something about it. But the only thing that we can do is trust that Jesus is taking care of that for us. And we need to know what that looks like. We need to understand what that means. We, 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 we get to know ourselves in our need for a Savior. When we, when we put ourselves in reflection of who Jesus is versus who we are, we understand we need a Savior. We understand that there's a holy God, and we're not holy, and we need to be holy. And so what happens is that that need for a Savior causes us to cry out for salvation. It causes us to cry out for salvation. And so what that means is when we cry out for something, what we're saying is I'm coming to you, God, in a, with a sense of humility. And that sense of humility is saying I understand and I admit that I don't have the answers. That cry uh, for, for salvation comes with a sense of surrender. And it says I am submitting, God, to your deliverance because I've looked for my own deliverance and I cannot find it. I don't have the ability to have the answers. I don't have the ability to deliver myself. I'm pleading for mercy in this cry for, for, uh, for salvation. And it's that, it's that realization that I am an unworthy person in front of a holy God. And God, because of that, I need you to have mercy on me. That's the cry of salvation. That's what it looks like. It's faith in God's power. It's, it's, it's understanding that he can do what no one else can do. And no other God, little g, can do. Is that he, he is completely the only one that can do that. And, it's, and, then, and that cry out for salvation is also a confession. Now, here's what I mean by confession. It's a proclamation of who God is. We've taken this head knowledge that we've had. We've moved it into our heart knowledge. And because of that heart knowledge has caused us to cry out for salvation because we, we have seen ourselves in light of who Jesus is, that cry for salvation that involves humility and a plea for mercy and all of this causes us to confess. And, and out of, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, it says, Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you want to know what's in somebody's heart, listen to what they talk about. Do they talk about themselves a lot? then you know their heart is full of themselves. Do they talk about money? Do they talk about their career? Do they talk about their family? What is it? I mean, it may not be a bad thing, but it may not be a God thing. And so the Bible says that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. In Matthew 16, 16, Peter says this. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Out of the overflow of Peter's mouth, of his heart, his mouth spoke. He said, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You're that one. You're the, you're the one that we cry out for. Um, another form of confession is baptism. Now, we're in a church that is non-denominational. We have a lot of different backgrounds in this church. And here's what I know. There's some people who were probably baptized in here as infants. There are others that were baptized at a very young age. And others have not, either haven't been baptized or are baptized later in life. But baptism is not, according to what the Bible teaches, the source of our salvation. Baptism is because of our salvation. The moment, the Bible teaches us that when the, the moment that we come into a relationship with God, the moment that we have made that decision, not somebody has made that for us, but the moment that we have made that decision, that the Bible teaches us that we are to be baptized. Jesus himself was baptized. 
When we look at that, he, he, John the, ba- the baptizer, his cousin that we talked about a little bit last week, when, when John the baptizer um, stood in the water and Jesus came to him and said, I need you to baptize me, and, and John's response was, it should, it should be you baptizing me. And Jesus says to him, no, it's, it's right for us to do this. Why is it right for us to do this? Did Jesus need to be saved because to be baptized to be saved? No. He was giving us an example of what our lives should look like. Everything Jesus did was a model for us to follow. And so he modeled baptism. And when he did that, the Bible says that the Trinity showed up. The heavens opened up. A a dove came down. It's the only time we see the the Trinity all together in one spot in the New Testament. And and, and God gave approval to it. See, we we are baptized as a public confession of our relationship with God. And as, a, and as an opportunity for us to stand in front of our friends and our family and be able to say, this is who I belong to. This is my confession of who God is. And so the next thing I want us to see is this. Number three is our belief combined with our confession affords us salvation through trust. I'm going to say that one more time. Our belief combined with our confession affords us salvation through trust. Now, I want to give you two different scenarios here before I jump into to some, some other things. If I were to come to you after the service this morning and invite you to dinner in my home, first of all, you'd be really sweet for saying yes because you know that I cannot cook, right? But you say yes, and I say, well, great, we're going to meet at my house Friday night, 6 o'clock. It's going to be a great time. You go, great. We go through the rest of the day. I call you tomorrow morning and say, hey, look, I know we talked about this yesterday, but I just wanted to be sure. Um, Friday night, 6 o'clock, you're still coming to the house, right? You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah well, I, I'm sure. I mean, we talked about it, but yeah, well, we're good. Tuesday rolls around, probably about mid-afternoon. I send you a text. Hey, just, just a reminder, um, I invited you to dinner at 6 o'clock on, on Friday night, and you said you were going to come. You still coming? And you're like a little bit annoyed, and you're like, uh, yeah, said I'm coming, I'll be there. Wednesday, I do the same thing. Thursday, I do the same thing. By the time Friday rolls around, you're not really sure whether you want to go or not, right? You're like, he's been a little bit of, of a pest about it. But here's the thing. At some point, either I trust that you're coming to dinner or I don't. At some point, I'm either going to have faith that the answer that you gave me is real, and I'm going to rest in that, and I'm going to be okay with that, and I'm going to have dinner ready to go at 6 o'clock, or I'm going to continue to ask over and over and over again. You see this happening in the spiritual lives of a lot of people, especially young, young kids, when they're, they're, when they're saved at 8 years old because they trusted in an experience. And then again, they're saved at 14, and they're baptized at 14, and then again at 14 and a half, right? Because they, they heard a great song at a youth camp or they had this emotional moment. And then again at 18 when they've gone through a, a college experience that, they, that has shattered them and they don't know how to react to it. And then maybe again after they've had kids and like, God, I'm serious this time. My kids need to be raised under Christian. Right? We, at some point, they, you have to trust. At some point, you have to trust that God is exactly who he says he is or he's not. And if he's not, I would tell you you're not saved. Because there cannot be a salvation where there is no trust. About September of last year, I'd, I'd gone over to Baton Rouge. My son was getting engaged on that particular weekend. And we were, we, were in the, we were on LSU's campus, and I was getting into the car. And as I was getting into the passenger seat, I was using my left hand to, to press on the back of the seat. And when I did, my hand slid down as I was pulling myself up, and my ring finger got caught on the seat in a weird way. And I'm pretty sure it popped the ligament in my ring finger. Immediately, I said some words probably I shouldn't have said. But here's the thing. Um, It hurt. I don't think there was anything you can do about it, so I didn't put it on the prayer list. But what happened is it it began to swell, and it was not doing well. So I took my ring off because I knew that as it swelled, I didn't want my ring to to get in there and and create a, a... you know, cutting off of the blood circulation, all that kind of stuff. So I took my ring off. Well, here's the problem. My ring finger has not gotten back down to the normal size. So since September, I have not been able to wear my wedding ring. So for some of you who have thought in gossip, they said, hey, look, I think JJ and Stephanie are having problems. We're not. We're not having problems. Um, we're, we're doing okay. Here's the thing. I cannot fit my ring over the knuckle 
on my ring finger. And it bothers me. Probably bothers me more than it bothers my wife, but it bothers me because for 25 years, coming up on 26 here in May, that ring has been on my finger. And now since September, I've not been able to, uh, to, uh, to wear it. But you know what? I'm still married. And my wife still trusts that we're married. And you know how I know that? Because she still lets me in the house every night when I come home. She still feeds me. She still takes care of me. She still spends the money that we make. And so I, we are still in a married relationship. Now look, she is fantastic. And I trust her and she trusts me. But I don't need the ring to, 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 to know that I'm married to her. It's a great reminder and I love having it. But I don't have to have that. I trust her. And it's not because of the ring, it's because of her. And it's because I know her so intimately and so personally. And so I gotta, I've got to trust that what I know and believe about God is true and personal. Now here's why that's so important. Because you've got to begin to ask the question, is what does salvation look like? Like JJ, I have... I've had that moment where I've had that head knowledge go into the heart knowledge. I've had that moment where I've cried out for salvation. I know God personally. But say I, I still kind of sometimes struggle in what does it look like? What does salvation look like? How does that play out in my life? Well, I would tell you it plays out in, in several different areas. One I would say is this. Is that it plays out in that it gives you a freedom from sin and guilt. How many times do you see people who are struggling with their own salvation... Who, 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 who cannot forgive themselves for something that happened years ago. They won't let it go, even though God said, hey, look, that's not the way I work. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Is God honest? Is he true? Is that who he is? Do I trust that? Because if I trust that, I need to, leave my, I, I need to stop convicting myself over and over again. Because if God has forgiven me, I need to move on. I've got to trust God, right? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, he says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Is that true? Well, absolutely it's true. And we've got to believe that and we've got to trust that. And that's how it plays itself out in our lives. That, so it gives us a freedom from, say, the law and from the, the curse of the law. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. We don't have to carry the burden of sin anymore because Christ did that for us. He climbed on a cross and he died for our sins, not his. If he had sinned at all on his own, when he crawled on the, on the cross, he would have been dying for his own sins. But he hadn't sinned. He lived the perfect life. And because of that, he died for our sins. Colossians 2, chapter, four, or chapter 2, verse 14 says, He forgave us all our sins having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. It also looks like freedom from death. How many of you have, have, have ever been scared to die? Just thinking about it, just the, the, the thought process of the whole deal. 1 Peter 1.3 says this, In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We have no worries as people who are truly saved of where we will be at the moment that death takes place. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Bible even tells us that Jesus and his angels will, will escort us into his presence, into the, 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 uh, the holiness of God. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse uh, 40, 54, it says, death has been swallowed up in victory, Right? That's what, we, that's what we celebrate at Easter, is that, is, is that alone. It, it looks like freedom of, from, from judgment. You want to know how that plays out in your life? It looks like freedom from judgment. Romans 5, 9 says this, Since we have now been justified from his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Hebrews 9, verse 28 says, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation. We are free from judgment. As Christians who are saved and walking in the, in the grace of the Lord, we don't have judgment anymore with the Lord. We're saved, and we don't, have to, we don't have to worry about that. He has taken care of that for us. 
But the problem is, for those who are unsure of their salvation and they don't know God and they've not allowed themselves to make this a personal deal for them, they still struggle with the fact of judgment. They judge themselves over and over again because they can't understand a God that doesn't judge them anymore. And that's who God is. It's freedom from fear. That's how it plays out in our lives. In Hebrews 2, verses 14, he says this, He too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. And 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power. And so, if we've gotten to this far, we understand that this knowledge of who God is becomes a heart issue for us that causes us to cry out for salvation. And, cry, and through that salvation, we begin to see that manifest itself in our life in, in, in ways of, of freedom from guilt and freedom from all these different things that we just mentioned. Then, I can have assurance of my salvation. But watch this. My assurance of salvation comes from the truth of God, my confession of Christ, and the trust of his character that I learned from Scripture. All right, let me say that again. My assurance of salvation comes from the truth of God, my confession of Christ, and the trust of his character that I learned from Scripture. So let's look at Scripture. Because here's what I want you to do. I want you to walk out of here today with 100% assurance that you're saved. I don't want anybody to walk out of here with, with anything less than that. Because as Christians, it should never be 99%. It should never be 60%. You should be able to look at me and go, you know what? Without a shadow of a doubt, I know that if something were to happen to me today, I'm going to heaven. I don't have to worry about it. I know God's got everything under control. And I know that it, it would not be wonderful for my family if I would be left behind. But I know God's got this. And I know it will all work out for his glory. So let's look at some, some scripture that, that shows us how we can be assured of this. In Ephesians 1, verses 13 to 14, it says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Watch this. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession. Look at this in John chapter 10, verse 27 through 30. It says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of my father's hands. And I and the father are one. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, it says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not so that you can be 66% sure. Not that you can feel good about it one day and, and, and better about it the next. He says, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Romans 8.1, and I, one of this is one of my favorites. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 10, 11 says, anyone who, puts, who trusts him will never be put to shame. And then Psalms 9, 10 says, those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. I, look, I hope, and, and my prayer really is, I was preparing this message and I was getting it ready to go, that everyone in this room would be able to look at me and go, you know what? That's the way I felt all along. But what I know, and if we're honest, in a room with this many people, is that I know that's not true. I know that there are some people in here who have struggled with this in your own assurance of your salvation. And it's because you trusted in something other than what really the Bible teaches us is the salvation experience. That belief in who God is. The confession of who He is. And the trust of who He is. And I pray this morning that every single one of you, because you know this, can walk out of here with 100% assurance of your salvation. And I pray that you'll live up to the challenge that I've given to you, that you will share this with your family members, that you'll share this with some friends, and that you'll say, hey, look, will you watch this? Because I'd love to have this conversation with you. Because you might be opening the door to somebody to have a conversation with you that they've never known how to have. And what a great opportunity it gives you to share Jesus and to share assurance of salvation. If we do nothing with this, then nothing will come of it. But I know this, that God's word does not return void. 
And so that I know that if we do something with this, when Easter comes around here on April 17th, I believe with all of my heart that this room will not be big enough to hold everybody that will come to worship because of who he is and the promise of salvation that we have in him. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the assurances that you give us in your word. I thank you for the way that you love us, for the way that you take care of us. I thank you for your character of who you are. I thank you for the, the just the, the salvation that we have through your son, Jesus Christ. God, there are people who need to hear this message. There are people who need to deal with this question. And they need to get this settled because it, until they get it settled, God, there's no peace in their life. And I know you desire for them to have peace. And so, God, I pray that you would, for those in here who are hearing this message this morning, that they are receiving peace even right now. That they would have the courage to, to have a conversation that, they, that may be a little bit difficult to have, but they would have the courage to have that conversation. But God, for those who have 100% assurance, I, I pray that you give them the courage to send this out, to have a conversation with their friends or their family members, and be able to open up a faith conversation with somebody that they've never been able to do. Because I believe there are a lot of people who are wanting to have this conversation. And I believe, God, that when we do that, that you will bless that. I believe that this church will overflow with people who want to come and worship in thankfulness because of who you are. And we thank you even now for what Easter will look like because of that. And it's in your son's most precious.